10 years, mm -hmm. and that the science that we compiled helped our governor, Governor Cuomo, do the right thing and ban fracking in New York. Um, by popular demand, um, we keep bringing out our compendium because the um, fracking keeps kind of expanding with new pipelines and compressor stations. So this year, the people of Massachusetts asked us to um, really focus on compressor stations, so we did a whole big review of the scientific literature and the risks and harms. So um, now I'm here to take a look at the site, and I have to say, from everything I've seen, it's basically the worst site in America that I've ever seen for a compressor station. It's, I've just never seen anything like this, right? Because yeah. I mean, there's two problems. One is that there's toxic emissions, um, because the gas coming through the compressor, you know, the, the compressor station has to keep the pressure up and push the gas further north, right? And so, um, it ha it, by design, it, it has to vent gas every now and then when the pressure gets too high, otherwise it'll explode. Mm -hmm. And in that gas are things like uh, other hydrocarbons that are have been locked inside the shale with uh -huh. methane, including mm -hmm. things like benzene, which is a percentage, and formaldehyde, and other percentage. Uh -huh. So these are released. Now, benzene and formaldehyde are often released by the space, but the steps are much higher. Right. This is released right at lung level, so it's there will be human exposures, and, and that that population is already a the burden of their pollution. So this is really like right. one of the last straws on the camel's back for all the kids and everyone who lives so close by. And then there's the explosion risk, which often happens with these things. They're just naturally unstable. It's kind of a bad piece of technology, just in terms of these safety. There's no real way to make them make them safe because it's, you're just, it's like high pressure explosive gases going through there. So in Michigan, last January, in a remote area, probably that no one was hurt, there was one of these times where they had to quick release methane to control the pressure, but it was in the middle of the polar vortex. So the gas didn't evaporate as the models all assumed it would. It was so cold, the gas traveled along the ground and then the whole thing flew. Um, it, and, and so it took out, you know, the blast zone was enormous, but it was in the middle of a remote area. That happened right next to the Four River Bridge. It would be, you know. So yeah, you, you confirmed everything we've been talking about for five, five yeah. years now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, it's great to hear you say all that. I mean, we've been talking about this for so many years, and here you are confirming everything. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we tried to bring all the science from the peer-reviewed literature, and some of our public health scientists in New York really took, because we have a lot of compressor stations in New York. We banned fracking, but we didn't ban the infrastructure, so there's ongoing concern. Um, and we were shocked when we saw what the data looked like for what, what it does to air quality. And our air is pretty good in rural upstate New York, and we're planning compressor stations in remote areas. I'm still opposed to those, but when I think about the risk to public health in a populated area like this, Location wise, you've never seen anything like this located in such a densely populated area. She's been all over the world. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've looked at fracking in Argentina, in Mexico, in Romania, in um, France, all in 20 states out west. I've never seen a site more ill suited for something like this. I'm really concerned. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's unbelievable where they want to look at this. Yeah. So, you know, the hope really is that um, <laughs> the governor will do the right thing here. Um, so, you know, I'm, just, I'm assuming you're working with your constituents to yeah, try to raise the political yeah. pressure to bear. Yeah. Um, it's a tremendous friends group that's um, very much based on science and fact yeah. and um, in the forecasting models. And they've um, very much focused on this site and this activity and the location. It's not about not in my backyard. It's right. about what's wrong with this highly dangerous activity, um, this public health menace in this site. So yeah. it's a great friends group to work with. Frax has done a tremendous job and uh, the three towns actually uh, have really stepped forward in leadership. So it's, it's really been um, excellent to work with the larger groups. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, okay. it's a terrible site and it's probably the worst idea of a site that we could have selected. Absolutely. You know, there's no public need for it. Uh, mm -hmm. Public safety concerns, public health concerns, the environmental concerns. I appreciate you coming down and sharing your expertise and uh, knowledge. We'll be giving a more technical talk tonight at Boston University. Um, and I, I would have to say that um, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Greater Boston, did a great job in their own report, which I know is an advocacy report, but I kind of looked it over with a scientist's eye. It's like, yeah, they got all the science, you know, is really vetted and very, none of that is. Um, so written in a, in a spectacular way. It's, yes. it's reliable, yeah. yeah.
yeah. yeah. Pragmatic, very grounded. Yeah. That's the way it read right. to us and I'm, as well. I'm kind of really concerned about this, you know, health impacts assessment that was done, which are a really useful tool, but if they're misused or data is hidden and it doesn't fit the conclusion that somebody wants, then it, it can be it can be a tool of deceit where you can make something look more harmless than it really is. So I was really shocked to see that there was all this air quality data that was just quietly sidelined and not included. That, I've never seen that in an HIA either. So It really, I felt, diminished the concern, legitimate concerns right. and questions that people right. were asking um, just from the start of that, from that framework and lens. It was just it diminished all of those concerns. Right. And I think you can't ever expect a robust response or outcomes from something like that when it started from, from that place. Yeah. You can make a decision, the incomplete data, you can't make a decision on incomplete data, and then say afterwards, oh, if it was included, we still would have made the same decision. <laughs> no, that's, that's not how science works. No. Yeah. And there's some brand new science out now from Pennsylvania showing that exposure of people to compressor station emissions is highly dependent on which way the wind blows, which seems obvious. Um, but in other words, you can have a group of people who all live within 500 feet, but if the prevailing winds are tra trending in one direction, you can have really highly exposed people there. And there's nothing we can do about the wind, right? We can't regulate that. Um, and there's no way to have a compressor station that won't blow up unless you allow it to vent periodically. So it, this is just, it's just a, um, a kind of Stone Age technology. You know, it's not, you can't make it, it's not like it has plumbing leaks that you can use rules and regulations to go in and fix. Some stuff is like that, right? Like some stuff that I deal with in public health, like, like vaccinations. Um, there are some risks with vaccinations, but we, we need mandatory vaccinations, and we can tweak the how we give vaccines to make it safe, but we don't want to ban vaccinations. But there are other things, like lead paint, that we learned, and Boston was one of the places where we got the best data. But there's no way to make lead paint safe. You can't have a house with a toddler in it and somehow mitigate the risk. You have to ban lead paint. And like smoking in airplanes is another example. There's no way you can put filtration systems and have people smoke in an enclosed space and make it safe. So we had to ban smoking in airplanes. And compressor stations, I think, fit into that category of technology. Like, there's no box you can put them in or a lodge you can pass to control emissions. If they don't emit, they blow up. And if they do emit, they contribute to carcinogenic air pollution that's at a high risk. I mean, it's, we can measure it, and especially if somebody lives right downwind from it, they're going to be harmed. And, and in populated areas, the last one. There's already increased levels in that basin now, and they're adding to those increased levels. Yeah, yeah. and it's a you know, low-income, high-minority area, so it's a really environmental justice issue. When, whenever some some company stands to make a profit and there's no corresponding benefit to the community, right? There's, this gas isn't going to turn on anybody's stove or to keep anybody's furnace going or lower prices for home heating in the area. It's all going for profits for export. And then all the people in the community where the gas is passing through are paying a terrible price, higher medical care costs, and um, it, it makes no sense under any circumstance to locate it. the combustion yeah. there. I mean, yeah. the, the, um, just, just public safety, you standing there, if you stand at the side like you saw it, whether you're a scientist or not, it just hits you in the gut that no way should this be allowed to be located so close to a major thoroughfare, uh, schools, And, and churches, the shoreline, right? I mean, it's, shoreline. it's like, I was, it makes I, no sense. I had no idea how close it was to the waterline. When you look at any of the climate models for ocean level rise, you know, all it takes is one hurricane and... Well, and the prevailing winds and the geography um, during a certain time of the year are absolutely sort of pushing everything into that basin area. Uh, and we're coming into that time of the year exactly when the winds switch around north, north, north and northeast, and that's where it's going to be coming in. So the, the natural topography and the natural wind patterns will actually blow and keep all of that um, this way. So, well, I mean, yeah, in some kind of the people are, weird, actually. toxic way, it's a really interesting sight, I have to say, because there's when you walk out there, you, you can feel that you're walking on silk. And you, and then I walked on part of the area that was just all clinkers left over from the coal plant, and then bricks from the um, Excuse me, folks. From the furnace. We don't mind. And, and then, Are we able to move this conversation just to the hallway for now, so we can use the yeah, reception we're area done. for its purposes? When the last nor'easter came in, there, there's you know, it carved out part of the bank that there's fly ash exposed. And then oil was put on top of it in their oil leaks. So you have coal and then a layer of oil, and now you're going to put natural gas on top of that. It's like this uh, unholy trinity of fossil fuels out there, right? 
Can we also introduce you to our colleague, Jim Hawkins? Hi, we did. Yeah, we sat right next together. Oh, 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 there you go. Well, thank you. It's nice to have you. It's fantastic.